Hello, you're listening to a special edition of Wine Blast with me, Susie Barry, and my husband and fellow master of wine, Peter Richards. So whether you're a long-time listener or a newcomer to the pod, you are very welcome. Mm, welcome indeed, uh, and we'll come on to why this is a special episode in a moment. But first... Um, I want to pick up on your introduction because I met someone recently and he questioned whether we were actually married to each other. Really? Yeah. Does he know something I don't? Um, well, he might know some things you don't, given that he's a winemaker professionally. <laughs> so I know he does. Definitely uh, knows a lot that I don't. This is uh, Ian Batt, lovely guy, makes delicious wines in Cairns in Australia. But um, thinking about it, I kind of hope he, he doesn't know things about our marriage that you don't, really. Cause that so would be, do I. That would be concerning, wouldn't it? A bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, the reason Ian was questioning the nature of our relationship was that he said we were, uh, and, I, and I quote here, too respectful and polite to each other to possibly be husband and wife. Uh, what do you make of that? Are we really that respectful and polite? <laughs> I mean, we are British, so a, a bit of that probably comes with the territory. Uh, and equally, we do try to keep things on a relatively professional footing mm. uh, when we record, yeah. uh, partly because leaving out the domestics tends to save time. It does save time. But we can soon change that, if needs be, No, Ian. please don't, please don't. Uh, certainly <laughs> not on my part, uh, because, you know, I did think about this afterwards, and, you know, I started to wonder if doing this podcast wasn't perhaps a bit like a form of marriage therapy for us just go with me on this one in that it kind of forces us to be civil to each other maybe slightly nicer than we are normally um and that's a healthy thing in a relationship so if i'm occasionally I'm, if i'm getting this right your theory <laughs> is that this entire podcast is basically marriage therapy for us that everyone has to listen in on in a nutshell yes uh, that's that, that, there we have it there we have it jo- drop the mic and move on uh, no 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 I'd, I'd sort of flip it around and I'd say mm. you know it's a proper podcast you know serious mm. in intent and execution it just happens to have this side benefit you know in other words that everyone gets to enjoy good wine content but they also as a sort of altruistic side effect get to support our marriage and I guess therefore by extension the ongoing existence of the pod okay so, um, so th- I, I'm sorry but are, th- th- <laughs> that's all getting a bit meta now so let's move on shall right. we okay. um, now yeah, I mentioned at the top of this special episode um, well that it is a special episode and mm. that's because it's our first proper dedicated listener Q&A episode as part of which we are going to tackle big issues mm. like the most interesting wine news Wines which are worth paying silly money for. Mm -hmm. Wines we should have loved but didn't. And Mm. how should you warm up your first growths in an emergency? (laughs) How about that? I can't wait. I can't wait. But uh, just to say before we get started proper, this is our 98th episode. Woohoo! There we go. How about that? (laughs) I can't Uh, quite believe it. We can't thank you all enough for giving us the most precious gift of your time and your support. Uh, The Wine Bass community just keeps growing. Uh, The pod keeps evolving. And it's a wonderful thing. So thank you for sticking with us. Yeah, yeah. And and and, and I think since we're we're touching on plans and evolution, one other thing to mention briefly is subscriptions, uh, which we're currently looking into and may introduce soon. Now, don't worry. I know what you're thinking. Wine Blast will not be disappearing behind a paywall. This is a podcast that will definitely remain free access. Mm. It's more a question of offering I don't know, juicy added extras in return for your support. So the idea is that subscribers will be able to access a whole load of bonus benefits. Yeah, yeah, like sort of exclusive access to full length uncut interviews. Mm-hmm. Uh, and believe me, the full interviews with people like Sam Neill, Oz Clark, mm-hmm. Miguel Torres, Hugh Johnson, Ernie Lozen, Tim Spector recently, yep, absolutely, Paul yeah. Hobbs, Charles Spence, they are well worth it. Mm. Mm, they really with are. Oz for the extra rude bits, which we had to censor. <laughs> anyway. Um, You've always you know, got to censor Oz. There may be also things like, I don't know, early access to early access to new episodes. Um, plus, we might do a subscriber-only newsletter with things like discounts, giveaways, maybe also some of our, uh, well, your uh, delicious recipes. Yeah, um, stuff truffle. Like tr- do you remember this like a... porcini and truffle arancini? Oh, oh my word. No, That's this like this could work well, but uh, this could work well. But just to reiterate, these are still ideas. All of these, just for mm. now, uh, we just wanted to keep you in the picture. But let us know if this is something you would be interested in or would support. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Yeah, the, the, it just seems that the subscription model feels 
definitely like the best fit for what we do here. So we'll be interested to hear your thoughts. Um, advertising is an alternative, especially if we can get a headline sponsor. But That would be good. But we'll see. You know, uh, anyway, <laughs> Anyone you know, out there? We also have plans for a book or two, as well as some tasteful merchandise. So keep your eyes peeled. It's all happening here. Uh, <laughs> right, that's enough about plans. Uh, we need to get into the fun and games of our questions and, and comments. Then. Absolutely. Okay, so yeah. I think the best place to start is with a question from Martin in Denmark, asking about the news. Now, more specifically, Martin said, says, there's a lot of news out there, but time is short. I agree, Martin. Mm -hmm. Any chance you could occasionally deliver a reduced version of the wine news based on what you think is important or has caught your attention? Doesn't have to be the mainstream stuff, just picking out the kind of thing that gets you thinking or which Mm. you'd flag up for our attention. Interesting, interesting. Thank you, Martin. Um, Kind of a big brief there. Um, And this one only came in recently, didn't it? But Mm. I think, you know, a a sort of pithy, irreverent news briefing mixed with other comments and questions could work really well as a format moving forward. Yeah, I I totally agree. Um, So... What's caught our attention lately, uh, right. both serious and perhaps slightly less so? Yeah, OK. So so one thing that definitely caught my eye recently was how uh, a new study is rewriting wine's ancient history. Um, so you know how we thought lots of our wine grapes and winemaking history came out of Georgia uh, mm-hmm. or, or the South Caucasus region more generally? Well, it turns out that might not be right or... or maybe the whole truth. So this was a study published in the Science Journal and was much larger than previous grapevine genome studies. And it revealed not only was the grapevine probably domesticated earlier than we thought, so about 11,000 years ago rather than 8,000 years ago, but it was also domesticated in two places at the same time, not just in the South Caucasus region, but also in the Levant, so modern day, you know, Lebanon, Palestine, Israel, Jordan. Yeah, and I mean, I remember you, you picking up on this, um, mm. but, 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 you know, you've looked into this more than me. What does it mean for winemaking today and, I guess, wine's history in general? Yeah, so that's the interesting part. It's quite a convoluted thing and you've got to tease out bits. But it does now seem from this study that it, it was the, the Levant region rather than the Caucasus from where vines moved westwards into Europe, sort of cross-breeding along the way, as As you you do. do. (laughs) Uh, And and it was those great vines that ultimately became the main winemaking vines we know and love all across Europe and, you know, and the wider world today. That's intriguing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like we might actually need to look into the Levant again in, in wine terms. Mm, I, um, think so. yeah, I think, yeah. I think there's, there is scope there to explore that a bit further. Um, maybe even a de- dedicated episode. Wait, it's such a think? big issue, isn't it? I totally it agree. Maybe it we'll is, do that. And, and fascinating. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. But moving on now, uh, though, you did you see that uh, Champagne Telmont is to release what is apparently the lightest ever champagne bottle? Mm. Um, it weighs... 800 grams so 35 grams less than a standard champagne bottle um, apparently glass bottles represent 24 percent of telmon's carbon em- emissions um, and this move will reduce each bottle's carbon footprint by four percent mm. um, they'll be available to buy from well not till 2026 but i guess that's the aging process isn't it they have I to start think it, putting the wines in bottles now it for must them to be, be released yeah 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 two, two years down the line, yeah probably. and 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 actually telmon is aiming on this note to be net positive by 2050. Mm. So a little while, but they are aiming for that. Um, they've done other good things like uh, binning gift boxes, which frankly yeah. I do always think are a complete mean, yeah. blooming waste of time, well, um, waste and, of and clear yeah. glass bottles as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and, in, and the initiative is supported, get this, by the brand's investor, who just happens to be none other than Leonardo DiCaprio. Oh, there we go. Woohoo. He's something of an environmentalist, isn't he? As I far think as I understand. So. I think he must be, mustn't Interesting. he? Interesting, though. Uh, you know, about the new bottle. Um, I guess, you know, at the same time, lightweighting champagne, you know, is a challenge because it needs to resist all that, withstand all that pressure. Exactly. It? I mean, so, it's one, it's a really, a really big challenge. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's a very Just different to a strength. still wine. Well, I wonder how, how you know you've gone too far. <laughs> A lot of smashing That's bottles. A lot of explosions. <laughs> um, so on talking about uh, bottles, did you see that the Wine Society has just released more figures on their attempts to go net zero by 2040, um, saying their biggest carbon footprint by far is in the making and disposing of glass wine bottles, which they've now quantified as representing 31% of their emissions. That's quite a lot, isn't it? It's, it's a big Gosh. chunk, but it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's what we ex- sort of in the ballpark we expected, isn't it? We yeah. know this is a big thing. Yeah. Um, 
The next biggest is growing grapes and making wine. So that's quite a big umbrella. And that only accounts for 17% or something. You can't really ditch that bit, can you? You can't. That's quite essential <laughs> to the business. Uh, I think transport is about 21%, actually, if you put both in the UK and two. But, but even so, 31% glass bottles. You know, so just interesting context. And mm. I think that's precisely why we're seeing so much talk about, you know, an action on things like bottles, cans, bagging boxes, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I, th- I think the wine society is starting to convert their own label range, aren't they, to bag in in box which is really a bold move I would say Um, now we did explore all this in our episode selling net zero wine so do check that one out for for more just moving on uh, but keeping on the subject of glass did you see that English sparkling wine is getting a new glass I Mm -hmm. did so there were a a series of Mm. tastings earlier this year I took part in, in one of them actually to find the wine glass best suited to English fizz and now glassmakers Riedel are making a specific glass to bring out the best in your English bubbles. There we go. What a lovely thought. Um, isn't it based on, on a Riesling glass? Though? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so Reed will obviously make a whole load of glasses suited to different grape varieties and wines. And, uh, and we tried a range, but it was one designed for Riesling that worked the best. So they've made a few tweaks and it's going to be launched very soon. Mm. Um, I'm not sure we actually have room for any more glasses in our house, <laughs> but it's true. an interesting one. Um, <laughs> and I did actually sit down for a chat and record session with Maximilian Riedel so we may come back to this topic another one okay another one to come back to okay interesting interesting and um, one final thing from my perspective to mention uh, in news terms were, were the devastating wildfires in southern Chile in January and February which were so sad they were sort of a hammer blow to what's been one of the most exciting sectors of Chilean wine lately um, you know some of old Chile's oldest vines and vineyards were destroyed uh, there was significant property damage some wineries were ruined this was literally Chile's wine legacy and history going up in smoke uh, apparently 692 grape growers were known to have been affected by the fires and of course you know it goes beyond wine of course 25 people died 2,000 homes were lost more than four. 400,000 hectares were burned. Was Am um, I right in thinking this was linked to the forestry industry, well, was partly, it? Well, yeah. You know, it's a complicated situation. But in the south of Chile, you know, the regions of Bio Bio and Edada, there's a huge amount of industrial pine and eucalypt forests for the wood pulp industry. And they were often built off the back of government subsidies as well. But, you know, often these are on contested lands that indigenous groups say were taken from them. And and these fires happen, you know, sometimes they're started deliberately, sometimes they're accidental. Uh, there's also suggestions of mismanagement, but, you know, who knows? And is, is climate change playing a part too, yeah, do you think? Oh, undoubtedly, undoubtedly. You know, fires in Chile summer are quite common, actually. Um, and some of these fires were in places like Maule and Colchagua, you know, which is much more central Chile. But they are getting worse. And, you know, Chile's had a long, long, very severe drought, which may well be part of a longer term pattern which is going to be challenging for vineyards generally. And apparently the the national vineyard actually shrank this year by 5%, according to the official figures, which, and and, and lack of water was cited as one worrying worrying reason why that is. So, you know, anyway, in the meantime, Chilean wine has lost some of its precious history in Mm. in what is really promising wine territory. Yeah, well, we send Um, send our best wishes their mm. way. And of course, we can all support by seeking out and and buying some of these brilliant wines from southern Chile. Mm. Uh, There's delicious wines like Old Vine Pais, Sanso, Moscatel. It, it is, as, as you say, a really exciting category, isn't it? And let's hope they can just rebuild. Right, I think we should move on. Um, just one final piece of news before we do. Drops of God. Uh, the famous wine anime series and books is going out on Apple TV. Uh, this you is really exciting. You genuinely excited about really this. Really excited. So I'm excited. Did, did literally the visual manifestation <laughs> of the excited emoji with my hands up. Just sort of, uh, you know, it's a brilliant story if you haven't come across it about a famous wine critic who dies and his kids have to compete for his inheritance by embarking on quests to find the finest wines known to humanity. It's a brilliant story. It's really well done. It's original, um, full of artistry. I love the book, so I cannot wait to see how it works on TV. Uh, it's actually a French Japanese, and I quote multilingual film so i'm not quite sure how the language thing is going to pan out Mm. but uh the wine bits i hope should be universal Uh, we can all get on with it let's hope so (laughs) um right right time to tackle a couple of comments and questions from social media and email and Mm. first up we have sophia who delivered a brilliant comment on our wine and your microbiome episode and she said so red wine and tannins are good for you best news perfectly timed and I don't need to know anything else ever. (laughs) 
Yeah, we're, Love it. We're with you there, Sophia. Uh, let's, let's all just give up and enjoy red wine. Uh, she also wrote, uh, I've been a fan of the show since the beginning and still love every episode. Thank you for being such great wine chat company every time. It feels like I'm sharing a good bottle with friends. Uh, I would love to ask you both about wines you should have loved but didn't. Uh, when everything from the grape, the style, the origin, the vintage, the winemaker to the reviews, hype, brand name and reputation ticks all your personal preference boxes, but then you tasted it and it just didn't do it for you. That is a tough one, Sophia, because um, I would say, to be honest, you know, we've been around the block enough with wine by now that when you rack up all those things, you are pretty much guaranteed to like something. Mm -hmm. um, what I'd say is what, what can be the case is that just one of those boxes isn't ticked. For example, it might be um, a, a Duff Vintage or, or the alcohol's a bit too high and that ends up spoiling the whole thing, which was the case, for example, with a couple of the, the New Zealand Chardonnays we tried recently, wasn't mm. it, for yeah, our latest small, episode? Yeah, a small thing, but it did mm. make a difference. Yeah. Just, knocks something just a couple just of them, yeah. Knocks it out yeah, of yeah. yeah, so, I mean, for example, you know, I love, take a different example, I love, I love Cabernet. Sauvignon more than you probably I think so yeah um, but a lot of the top you know often very expensive Napa cabs for example really don't do it for me so sorry to those who, who adore them um, there are things like the 2009 2010 Bordeaux uh, which are both vintages roundly declared as vintages of the century um, and there are some amazing wines in those but there are also too many disappointing ones because people just couldn't control themselves and made overripe over alcoholic wines which is why those vintages for me aren't great vintages because across the board there's too many disappointing wines uh while i'm on my soap soapbox what else uh well pretty much every px sherry too i don't get on with um uh, I, though I did try a 1914 once that I did appreciate from Gonzalez Pais. So maybe it just needs 100 years or so. That's all PS yeah. needs for me. Um. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> and, and I'd actually add some pretty prestigious uh, zero dosage sparkling wines to the list too, mm. even though mm. I did my Master of Wine dissertation on the subject. And I think it's very interesting. I also think it's a trend that's gone a bit too far. Um, and and there, are, there are too many, and again, often very expensive and high reputed wines that are just unbalanced yeah so um i'm aware we probably let you down a bit there sophia sorry uh, you wanted names and we've given you generalities but yeah and we've kind of done styles that we don't yeah, like as opposed to you know you know as we said it's, it's a really tough one to answer it do just doesn't often happen for us and and so maybe what we love to hear is your thoughts on wines you should have loved but didn't all of you out there give us a shout um meantime moving on in the same episode that sophia referenced wine in your microbiome we fleetingly mentioned the importance of not just red wine but social interaction to human health and longevity and our pal chris jackson contacted us to point out malcolm gladwell had made a similar point in his book outliers about an italian emigre community in pennsylvania in the 1950s where people mainly died of old age rather than illness and this was put down not to diet or genes or environment but strong social cohesion and community and Wine can, of course, help with that, but, you know, it's, it's interesting that, that, yeah, that was the case. It can just to, indeed. Just to touch on it. Uh, again, in that same episode, we featured red wines high in polyphenols and Richard White emailed to say, What a shame. You were so close by with <laughs> Madaran and Samon and then chose to go to Argentina for Malbec instead of Cahors. Richard. We do love a good Malbec from Kaur, so so we heartily endorse this shout in in general. But in that in that program, we wanted to make the point that red wines can be high in polyphenols for different reasons. Mm. One being grape variety, but in this case also the fact being grown at high altitude in Mendoza meant the environmental stress, mm. including UV re radiation, you know, had a similar effect. So it it was a thematic choice mm. as much as anything, and I, I hope that clarifies. That. Yes. Now, in early 2023, we did an episode entitled The Year Ahead of Wine Lovers Wish List. Uh, we asked what your greatest hope for 2023 was. And Roscoe wished that the price of Penfold's Grange halves. Uh, quick as a flash, Paul Etherington wrote in to say, your would-be Grange drinker needs to focus on, on St. Henry. Same house and a fraction, never mind half the price. So there you go, Roscoe. Uh, I'd also throw in personally the RWT Shiraz uh, which is stunning wine. I mean, it's, it's still pretty expensive. Um, if it's too expensive, then the Bin 150 Marananga. Uh, also, just have to mention here, the Bin 389 Cabernet Shiraz, which is one of my favourites from the Penfolds portfolio. 
it's you know in terms of value for money outstanding i did a tasting of it back to 1986 not too long ago it's sensational wine get you um yeah <laughs> so paul also said that his wish was to get back to sharing wines with friends and he said which is what wine is all about yeah, yeah. cheers to that yeah. paul um talking of getting through difficult times rob wrote us a lovely review on apple podcasts which read as follows I've worked at a winery in Oregon, USA, and though that is well behind me now, I still love to listen, chat and enjoy wine speak. Susie and Peter are so much fun to listen to. It feels like the famous George Burns and Gracie of wine. The way their podcast is presented is lighthearted and not too serious. What a breath of fresh air in our apocalyptic world in 2023. Keep up the fun and be certain you have found a new listener in the USA. Thanks, Rob. Lovely thing Fantastic. to say. Fantastic. Uh, we'll admit we did have to look up George Burns and Gracie. You uh, admit that we've, we've lost our listener. <laughs> no, I hope He's no, no, Rob, don't Lord. go away, don't go away. But we, we do now consider ourselves better educated educated about American comedy duos. We do. That's clearly ignorance on our part. Um, so thank you for that, Rob. Uh, and here's to a slightly less apocalyptic future, uh, on which note we had a delightful speak pipe message from Pat. Hi, Susie and Peter. This is Pat from upstate New York. I love listening to the show. Uh, I always love getting the British take on things. Uh, I think of the Brits as the original importers of great wine. So keep up the good work. I enjoy listening and I look forward to the next podcast. Thanks so much. Thanks, Pat. Um, it's true to say Britain has been one of the key global hubs for wine over the years. And we always consider ourselves very fortunate to be based here, to have access to the the tremendous range of wines and tastings and events mm. we do. Mm. Um, so we try to make the most of it. On your behalf, of course. Entirely selfless. <laughs> uh, you know, so we've had lots of lovely, positive, encouraging messages like Pat's. Uh, we don't have time to read them all. But we'd like to say thank you to those who've taken the time to send them in. Uh, particular thanks as well to Stefan Kassar, who said he really loves our style. So refreshing in his words. And also to Moles, who said our podcast is a joy to listen to and so informative at the same time. Right. So in the spirit of being informative and entertaining, uh, there are two bigger subjects coming up next a controversy mm. over warming up some first growths and a question about what wines we'd all be prepared to splurge silly money on to recap so far we've touched on podcasting as a form of marriage counseling rewriting mm. wine's ancient history wildfires in chile a new wine tv drama wines we should have loved but didn't malcolm gladwell value alternatives to grange and George Burns and Gracie. There we go. Um, so is this the moment we come on to Pangate? It is indeed. <laughs> Not Pantsgate. You heard right. It's Pangate. Pantsgate. It's just too many Pantsgates to... Don't worry. To don't worry. It's, it's Pan. Pan. I don't think there are many Pangates. No. I would hope <laughs> go. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, no, we should set the scene. Um, this was an eye-opening debate, uh, if we can call it that. <laughs> After you'd tweeted a picture of two quite special bottles, Chateau Margot 1995 and Aubryon 2002, being heated up in a large pan of warm water. Yeah, there's no other way to describe it, is there? And no. I'm not quite sure how to contextualise all this, but anyway... I, th I suppose we should start by You're saying uh, we are very lucky to have some very generous and, and fabulous friends. And this was just one of those special evenings. It happens in wine sometimes. We're all very grateful when, when, when those evenings happen. Uh, and our friends had been running late and had forgotten to take these majestic first growths out of their you know pretty cold cellar. So these wines, the bottles were really, really chilly. Obviously, far from ideal to serve them like that. And the guys, these guys had arrived late, so... The main course was pretty much on the table. So the dilemma, the what dilemma, to do? The dilemma what to was do? how to get them to the right kind of temperature to properly appreciate them without destroying them in the process, mm. wasn't it? Mm. Hence the large pan and gently, I, I stress gently heated water. But after you tweeted, it did all go a bit mad, didn't it? it? Did, did, yeah, so I tweeted that photo and asked, how do you get your special red wines to the right temperature if they're too cold? And I admitted the whole pan situation did give me the fear. Uh, and we had some brilliant reactions. Uh, we've got some of the best ones here, yeah. haven't we? Yeah, yeah. To, I mean, there, there, uh, was, there was a fair amount of opposition to the pan strategy, wasn't mm, there? Mm. Summed up by Jean quoting Latin at us um, and writing, Vade Retro Satanus. <laughs> I'm not sure there's not any need to translate that, is there? And uh, you know when people get Latin or biblical on you, something's gone wrong. Yeah. Uh, the, the reaction wasn't dissimilar from Top Chef and 
top guy, it has to be said, uh, Michel Roux Jr., who responded by saying no, just no, no, no. Uh, to which, <laughs> to which I replied, surely even in your establishments you have the odd emergency chef. Um, so he came back saying, the sommelier gives me the bottle to cuddle. I so, can't believe he said so that. So, of course, I had to ask for a picture of said cuddling. I mean, he painted himself into that corner, frankly. Uh, I didn't expect to reply, of course, but he very gamely then sent me just the best picture of him cuddling a Jeroboam of Dominus. Absolutely priceless. He is pure class, that man, isn't he? Um, <laughs> yes. He's got such a good sense of humour. Yeah, um, and, and actually a chef who really gets wine. Yeah, absolutely. Chef with a sense of humour and he gets wines. Uh, you know, what a guy. What, more what could a we guy. Ask for? Class act. And, anyway. and, and a pretty, pretty fine cook too. <laughs> yeah, he's not bad at that. He's not bad at that. <laughs> Let's <either>. be honest. <laughs> um, but anyway, just to take up on, you know, far more important aspects of Michelle Rue Jr.'s uh, personality, the cuddling, the uh, cuddling mm. the wine. This cuddling the wine theme was actually quite a popular thread, surprisingly so. Hilarious. It's, often, it's clearly quite common out there who knew what, what, what are we doing i don't wrong? know what to yeah, say i know you know <laughs> another thing that were quite common surprisingly were radiators so our colleague mm. chris kissack wrote how during his bordeaux tasting visits in december one proprietor had he visited had forgotten to take the bottles out of the cellar to taste so he had them warming up on the radiator when uh, when chris arrived so you mm. know if bordeaux producers are doing it well radiators clearly you know yeah they are fair game. Acceptable. <laughs> um, and actually, didn't I just see um, the most beautiful old school French style radiator yeah, that had a specific yeah. compartment built into it for warming things Absolutely. up? Absolutely. Yeah, that was from Julie, uh, who said it was a radiator she'd seen at the Chateau de Valence. Uh, you apparently used to keep food warm in the 19th century. So what it's a brilliant a idea. With a compartment to like, stick your food the, in. The original um, hostess trolley. Yeah, I, I asked what it was called, expecting some very exotic name. And she said a, a radiateur chauffe plat. Which mm. is uh, quite mundane. To Pedestrian, me. really. Anyway, who am I to argue? <laughs> it's a very cool thing, uh, and they look beautiful. And maybe we should all get one, you know, for our first growth temperature related emergency. Well, there are so many of them, aren't of there? Thing. So, so many of those first growth temperature <laughs> emergencies. Anyway, just to add, we'll be putting all these photos and images up on our site. Lucky yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, well worth checking out. Yeah. Uh, but just to finish this story off, you had a bit of a rumble on the subject of microwaves, didn't you? Oh yeah, you? we did. We did. We did. So, in response to my original tweet. Um, our fellow master of wine, Stephen Skelton, wrote, um, what's wrong with a microwave? <laughs> and he tweeted a picture of his customised microwave with a bottle of Pichon Baron 2004 inside, saying, give it 20 to 30 seconds and remember, it warms from the inside out. Oh, my word. That, that, I have to say that, that really must have kicked things off, didn't it? Did. It did. You can say that again. Yeah. Uh, so Mark wrote, please stop everyone. You're giving me an anxiety attack. Uh, <laughs> Daniel Lambert said, Mark. just seems wrong on every level. Uh, Brian Reyes tweeted, this is blasphemy. And I'm having heart palpitations reading this. Uh, Kate said, microwave is sacrilege. It's a strong sort of religious bent. There is reason, quite a there? bit of religion going so, on here, so, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one post just read, I don't want to live on this planet anymore. Right. So, so well, it seems the world is split between people who microwave their wine and those who cuddle it. Yeah, fair it enough. Does, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Being, being serious, though, I, I guess the issue with the microwave in my world is the inherent lack of control. You know, mm. and you don't want to risk re ruining a, a very fine wine by totally baking it or ending up with an exploding bottle. Yeah, you know, you so go. maybe a large pan isn't so bad in a first gro first growth emergency after all. Well, maybe, maybe not. You know, I, I I don't know what to think anymore. There's too mm. much emotion flying around, personally, <laughs> uh, and Latin. Uh, so, anyway, you know, <laughs> if you did want some further listening on this subject, do revisit our episode, Are You Serving Wine All Wrong? Uh, in that one, from our first series, uh, we explain how to serve wine to best effect, including our infamous 2020 rule for making sure your wine's at the right temperature. Um, though, to be fair, thinking about it, we don't actually mention anything about large pans in that episode. And no cuddling either. No cuddling Or too. microwaves. Um, <laughs> maybe we'll have to do do that in another show because it needs updating. Clearly, the official advice needs updating. Anyway, update. um, there was one... <laughs> <laughs> there was one last question we wanted to feature, wasn't there? Now, we have aired this question before in our Wine of the Year episode back in December 2022, but we never actually answered it. So here's a shortened version of the question, and this time we are going to answer it. Hi, Peter and Susie. My name's Kirsten. I live in far northern California, and I'm a wine buyer for a food co-op, and I love listening to your podcast. And I've been listening to Burgundy Part 2 
and everybody complaining about how much they love Burgundy, but they hate the cost. And I literally just wrote a shelf talker yesterday about Domaine Tempier Bandol Rosé and the fact that it's $56 a bottle on the shelf and how I would long to buy a case and drink it all the time, even though I have a grocery store salary. But my question is, what wine are people willing to pay that much money for, regardless of how silly, frivolous, upset it makes them, because they love that wine so much? I'm curious what wine you all would pay, what you think is a lot of money for compared to your salary. As always, thank you, and please keep the good stuff coming. Cheers. Now, this is such a good question. We've been pondering it for some time. So sorry for taking so long to get back to you, Kirsten. But we, we pondered it while you, uh, Susie, tasted mm-hmm. the Domaine de la Romani Conti releases. We did, didn't we? And yeah. when I tasted the lineup of top 1982 Claret. So we, you know, we have been thinking on this. We've been pondering it. Um, it's been maturing slowly. We did also <laughs> put the question out there. And we've got some pretty fun feedback. Um, but we should probably start with our own first thoughts on this shouldn't we yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Um, so so, the, so i think the reason it's a good question is that, is that it's not about the most expensive or fancy bottles per se it's about which fine wines you'd buy even though it hurts mm, because mm. you love them so much and of course the level of pain depends on your circumstances at the time i would say you know i remember earlier on in our careers when we when we uh, went out to buy a bottle of Krug Grand Cuvée every time we had a book published, precisely because it was such a big indulgence. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it felt appropriate, yeah. didn't it? Yeah, it's about, it's, it's about wines you have a personal connection with, I guess. So even though they're almost too expensive, you can't help it sometimes. Um, and that's often about things that just make you happy for whatever reason, that, that generate emotion. It's not just about admiring excellence from afar, which it can be sometimes with wine, can't it? Yeah. So, you know, for us, things like, I don't know, um, Cristal Champagne, uh, or Vigna Tondonia, Gran Reserva, White, or uh, Ridge Montebello, or Grange des Pères yeah, from, yeah. from France. We've actually, we've uh, actually just on. nearly bankrupted ourselves, haven't we, on Tol, tol Puddle Pinot Noir from <laughs> Australia. True, I mean, I think there are probably too many to list them all. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, we, we spend our life trying to resist temptation, don't we? Um, but Dry River Syrah, I'm going to say, is one of my weaknesses. Yeah, you don't resist that, do you? Oh, no, no. Also, Albino Rocker's Barbaresco Brick Ronchi. Um, I'd say several grower champagnes. Eglurier mm. springs mm. to mind, but mm. there are quite a lot you of are them. You're a fizz girl at heart. I am you? a fizz girl at heart. Um, but saying that, we had Vegas Sicilia, didn't we, when we got engaged? We did we? Did I mean? It's, and also thinking about some of those you mentioned, it's almost as much about having to fight for an allocation or even find a certain vintage, isn't it? So you know, scarcity as much as the price that's the challenge. Um, and with Burgundy, of course, it's both. Thinking about the ultimate, mm. you know, mm. um, Jean Noir Gagnat was one of my first loves, but it's just you know, I used to buy it back in the day, but really tough to aspire to now. I, and... I mean, I, I love the Gagnat wines, but mm. so many other white Burgundies too. You know, most recently I was I was sorely tempted, as you know, to buy some mm. de Mende de Monti Coton Charlemagne Grand Cru 2021. Now that really would have broken the bank and probably ended in divorce. Ian. Yeah, we can work it through. We can work it through. <laughs> let's let's talk it through. Anyway, we put. Put this question out there, as we do, uh, and we had loads of responses, and here are some of the best. Now, Anna said, Menthea, champagne with meaning, mm. rare pre phylloxera things. Mm. Alessandro said, Coche Dury Merceau, Hill of Grace, an old Krug Grand Cuvée, here we go again, Ridge Montebello, Chave Hermitage Blanc, La Mission Aubryon. Now, American producer Randall Graham wrote, uh, I'm not prepared to spend big, but if I were, I might blow it all on Jamais Coat Roti or some older Rias. Oh, fair uh, enough. Our colleague and Rhone specialist, Matt Walls, mm. endorsed both of these shouts and added that for his part, he'd spent way too much on wine so far this year. But he said, I keep telling myself, it's OK. It's an investment. It is, Matt. It is, it is. Especially... It's, it's not, Matt. Good Just, Rhone. Oh, on. it is, it is. Go on. Anyway, Valerie investment also had a belly. confession. Um any more Richet or caught on Charlemagne. However, having had an evening of wine debauchery involving mm. a 1995 Drouin Marquis de la Guiche, I have an affectionate preference for that. We won't pry. 
We won't pry any further, Valerie. So many questions. Mm. Uh, anyway, moving Debauchery. on. Ridesmith said 1779 Tarantes, which is a Madeira. Uh, I asked a bit more about this and he said, uh, I'd had like four bottles in my life, poured it by the glass in 1993 for $27. The wine was wow. magic every time I took a sip. You know, quite a few people touched on fortified wines, mm. didn't they? From port to Madeira, a sherry. But of course, these tend to be relatively undervalued for what they are anyway. So not perhaps such a, a painful stretch. Yeah. Um, Joni wrote, sherries are often ridiculously cheap compared to other fancy wine. You have like a 20 to 1 exchange rate between mm. sherry and burgundy. You can get once in a lifetime experience sherries for £30. Hard to beat. Yeah, well said. That's uh, very true, Joni. Bob wrote, I'm 62. I was in the wine business in my 20s, a lawyer raising a family afterwards. Uh, never had a Grand Cru from the Cote de Nuit. Now both kids are out of college and out of the house. Uh, just splurged on my first one, a Bon Mar. But it's a 2019, so I have to be a little patient. Definitely mm. patience has its rewards, but <laughs> I'm not sure how far you can stretch it, but you know. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Fran said, I'll spend big on small house champagne for special occasions or no occasions just because it makes a Wednesday night feel like an occasion. I love that. Yeah. So Mr. Rude wrote, first time I tried the Vigna Tondonia Grand Reserve, I was so taken by the experience, synapses firing, that I poured myself a stiff G&T, drank it slowly on the balcony, then changed into my pyjamas and went to bed early. What? <laughs> so I was intrigued oh, by this too oh, yeah. and asked a, little, a few further questions. For okay. example, did you not like the Tondonia? And he said no. On the contrary, it was an overwhelmingly positive experience, but it was overwhelming the first time round. Not as in a powerful wine, he described it sort of rather low key and oxidized, but as in full of associations. And that I can really understand. You know, what he said was if I was a psychotherapist, I would serve all my clients a glass of Vigna Tondonia Grand Reserva. <laughs> and I love that idea. It's like the wine equivalent of Proust's Madeleine, isn't it's it? A, it's Just intriguing. <laughs> full of associations and really brings back stuff. Anyway. I found it a bit baffling too, I have to say. Oh, anyway, no. but to conclude, <laughs> Um, it's important to mention there was some opposition to the principle mm. of this notion or question. Mm -hmm. So John said, I suspect many people, myself included, are not prepared to pay the prices for fine wine. For me, £25 is the absolute limit for retail. And Russell said, there's no need... Currently, lots of 2016 Brunello under $40, Gigondas and Cote de Rhone 2020 under $30, some 2019 mm. and 2018 Bordeaux second labels under $30, Macon Village, Mouga, etc. Et yeah, I mean, bargain hunting definitely is one way around it. Uh, and there was a final philosophical point from HMOCC. Uh, the expectation of the price rarely matches the experience. Uh, many times I'm pleasantly surprised by affordable wines and disappointed with expensive ones. Mm, I do. Mm. Agree, but again, I think the opposite is also true. You know, if you really love a wine and you've paid what is for you an almost painful amount to have it, it can actually increase the pleasure sometimes mm -hmm. because you know it's a it's a fleeting glimpse of rapture. Yep, you know, I completely I, I completely agree with that. Anyway, we've reached rapture. <laughs> that must be a natural end point for the program. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna pick up on that, but yeah, no, I, maybe maybe it's a place to end. Can <laughs> we pick stop. up? Can we pick up there next time? <laughs> we can. We can. <laughs> right. Rapturous. There we go. Absolutely, the, the perfect end for this marriage counselling session. <laughs> uh, a, a roaring success, I'd say. We're still smiling. We're still here. Uh, so thanks to you, lovely people out there, for joining us as ever. Uh, please do keep the questions, comments, and feedback coming. Um, sorry if we haven't managed to feature yours this time round. Yeah, please do keep in touch. Uh, keep leaving us nice ratings and reviews and keep spreading the wine blast word too mm -hmm. uh, we very much appreciate it don't miss our next episode where we're exploring the magical and delicious island of santorini and its unique mm -hmm. wines once again here's to you for making the show what it is we literally quite literally couldn't do this without you so thank you and cheers mm -hmm.